Namaste and good evening. I, Chavi Jain, researcher at IMPRI, Impact and Policy Research Institute, Prabhav Evam, Niti Anusandhan Sansthan, Nai Delhi, extend my warmest welcome to you all to IMPRI, hashtag web policy talk. Today, we have gathered here for a book discussion on Brick by Brick, Democratizing Local Governance in Kerala, Insights from People's Plan Campaign, by Manjula Bharti. This discussion is a part of the series Hashtag Local Governance, organized by Center for Habitat, Urban and Regional Studies. I'm honored to introduce our moderator for the series, Dr. Uh, Tikendra Singh Panberg. Sir was former Deputy Mayor of Shimla and currently Visiting Senior Fellow at IMPRI, New Delhi. It is my further honor to introduce our speaker for today, Professor Manjula Bharti. Ma'am is a professor at Center for Urban Policy and Governance, School of Ur Habitat Studies, Tata Institute of Social Sciences, Mumbai. A very warm welcome to you, ma'am. Our discussions for today are Dr. Malika M.G., Associate Professor at School of Development Studies, Tunjak Ezithachan, Malalam University, Kerala, and Dr. Bijuti, Associate Professor at Department of Commerce, University of Kerala. Thank you for joining us, sir and ma'am. Now, I invite our moderator, Mr. Tikendra Singh Panva, to proceed with the deliberation. We look forward to learning from our esteemed gathering. Thank you, sir, and over to you. Uh, well, thank you, Chavi. I hope my voice is audible, or do I need to do no, a speech? It's, it's okay. loud and clear. It's good. Okay, fine. Thanks. So, welcome all. Uh, Chavi has already welcomed uh, all our guests, including Professor uh, Bharti, who is from this Mumbai, and uh, Dr. Malika and uh, Dr. Vyu. So, welcome once again, and thanks for joining us on this uh, series that we are running since long called Hashtag Local Governance. Actually, uh, we've been uh, raising issues of uh, of local governance, particularly urban governance, and not just urban governance, but union, you know, uh, issues pertaining to the the larger ambit of urbanization. Uh, and uh, for the first time, in fact, we are actually discussing a book, and uh, it's 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 really an honor for us uh, uh, actually to uh, to have two discussions, and of course, Professor Manjula, whereby. Uh, the people's plan, I mean, which, which in fact became one of the uh, the slogan uh, for the left to campaign in the country, that this could be an alternative to, because it came post neoliberalization, and this could be one of the forms in which, uh, you know, governance models could be integrated with the uh, empowerment and uh, what, uh, uh, what Professor Manjula has very eloquently brought in the book, because I don't want to go into de uh, details, because uh, it's better that Professor Manjula speaks about the book and uh, then our discussion, then maybe later I could just comment uh, on that. But just to give a meta narrative actually, uh, though that has also been very well covered uh, uh, in, in the book, uh, that uh, uh, I mean, the, I, I'm, the whole whole question of, uh, of power to the people, you know, when we talk about decentralization, it's not just decentralization, but democratization. So maybe 30 years down the line, what has actually happened? I mean, have, have the, the envisioned goals of uh, people's plan, uh, I mean, how far have we been able to go? Because, you know, uh, and Professor Manjil also really brings out, uh, you know, the, the hierarchy that exists uh, at, 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 at the local level. Of course, caste is one of the uh, important uh, elements which continues to reinforce time and again. So I don't want to go into uh, that. But you know, I just need to go a little bit away from the book, you know, and to bring in the whole narrative of uh, the meta narrative of uh, why, why actually this people's plan. And let me go to post independence, you know, uh, post independence actually when we had the centralized form of planning, and uh, what was uh, in one section of the left, the communists was called as a socialist model of development, but but in another section it was considered. Uh, you know, the, the whole development of public sector enterprises, public sector units, was a way 
in which you accumulate capital for the larger, for, for, the, for the big bourgeoisie, as, as it was termed, if you go into the, the literature. So, you know, they were not really very fascinated about, about uh, the, uh, the way the central planning took place. And, uh, you know, so what could be the alternative? Of course, the alternative, uh, when we talk about the programs of the, uh, of the communists and for the left, was, you know, that they'll, it, they'll get revolution in the country and then probably, uh, we didn't know what forms of models would be developed. But, you know, I, I remember being a, a participant to a discussion, and this was Professor Prabhat Patnaik who pointed out uh, that, you know, when the, I'm not talking about Kerala because Kerala, Professor Bharti will definitely cover, and, she, and actually she has traversed this history from, from the 1957 uh, when the first communist government was elected there. But in West Bengal, you know, uh, so when, when they came to power, they never thought that they would again come to power. Then again, they, they came to power the third time, you know, five times. They were there. So uh, it was Shok Mitra who, uh, who actually this conversation between Shok Mitra and Jyoti Basu, what would be your model of, of governance? How would you govern? You know, you couldn't, you couldn't have brought the Soviet model because the only model that they knew was the Soviet model. Okay. So where, uh, and, and I, I don't have to uh, go into those details. So actually the two things that Ashok Mitra actually made the left front government do in West Bengal. One was of course Operation Burga, uh, the land reforms, which is so essential, so uh, integrated to the, to the entire process of development. And the second was this uh, decentralization. I won't say it was democratic, but yeah, quite, quite, you know, that's why you have the mayor in council stuff. I'm talking about West Bengal. So, and you know, uh, so how would you, what, what governance structures would you create? And that's why every five years down the line, you had elections there. Having said that, actually, uh, what we witnessed in the people's campaign is something post neoliberal uh, era. You know, when we had uh, multilateral institutions talking about decentralization, how is it different? I think Professor Bharti would be able to cover that. Uh, you know, when we talk about, uh, it's not just 40% of the state plan goes straight away uh, to, the, uh, to the local governments. But I think, uh, uh, and in the present context, well, I'm more concerned, uh, uh, Professor Bharti, to discuss in the present context, because post 90s, and I was a member to review uh, uh, the 74th Constitutional Amendment with the uh, KC Sivar Ramakrishnan. You know, we've seen how how this decentralization has taken place. I mean, you pointed out that I think some 27 subjects have been decentralized uh, in the Panchayati Raj in Kerala, but uh, I'm afraid uh, not in the country, not only three or four subjects. So, you know, and, and forget about demo, democratization. So, and, and, and post 90s economy, if you talk about, we have the new gig economy, uh, more uh, uh, informalization and large scale actually privatization of utilities. Actually, that's how the accumulation of capital is taking place, uh, appropriation by disposition. I mean, how, how, are, how are you actually uh, understanding this? I mean, was because one of the important uh, motors of uh, the people's plan was, uh, not just uh, power to the people, but also uh, 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 more transparency, you know, more equitable uh, distribution, what I call democratic, uh, 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 democratization of the surplus that gets uh, 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 generated in the society. So I think, uh, uh, having said that, I don't really want to go more to that detail, but yeah, I think, uh, uh, I think I would uh, love to hear what Professor Bharti has to speak about. And uh, I haven't been able to read the entire book. It was just probably I, re I reached half of it and that's how I could gather what is it. But it's definitely a fascinating work that you have done. And I'm sure our discussions, uh, Dr. Malika and Dr. Biju would also point out uh, how, how, uh, and how, 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 how to really uh, critically view it. And of course, uh, what, what else needs to be seen in this entire process. But definitely it was a ray of hope. It's still a ray of hope. And it is a kind of lighthouse for uh, for many local governments. And because I have been the directly elected deputy mayor of Simla, I can understand what does it mean uh, and what actually empowerment is all about. Over to you, Professor Bhatt. And thank you. Please unmute, ma'am. Sorry. So thank you, Niketa Singh. Um, and good evening, everyone. Thank you, the entire team at uh, IMPRI for organizing this virtual talk on my book. And specifically would like to mention Dr. Arjun Kapoor for initiating the event and to take it forward. 
and my thanks definitely to moderator Mr. Dikhendra Singh and definitely to discussion Dr. Malika and Dr. Biju for agreeing to do the discussion on my book. I would like to thank my PhD guide and former finance minister of Kerala, Professor Thomas Isaac, for encouraging me to write this book. Equally important, I feel, are the series editors of the book, Dr. Joy Elaman, Professor Harilal, and definitely Professor K.J. Joseph, director of GIFT, who really took out his time in bringing this book out. Thank you, dear K.J. I would like to thank the subjects of my study, the tribals of Vainad and the women of Ulu refugees who cooperated with me in making this study participatory. Then to my family, thank you dear ones for supporting me with the space and the time to engage with the work of the book. Now coming to the book. Any discourse or debate uh, on development I think is incomplete without critically engaging with power. And power matters, and that too very substantially. I feel as human beings, uh, creativity, community, and communication are the major factors that connect us. And the organic link that's produced position us in our habitat, which are subsequently rooted through the socio political and cultural dispositions as habitus that enable to navigate competently within the habitat. So when we try to understand power, I feel it is important to critically engage with the ways in which habitat and habitats forms and informs one another. One of the crises of the postmodern context, I feel, is the breakdown of the organic link between habitat and habitus especially when we try to understand it in the context of communication and communities. When the tools of communication determine the content of the message, communication gets increasingly alienated from real communities. This gives rise to hypothetical and hyper-real communities. We could say that in a Baudrian language, which are mechanically connected, but organically alienated from one another. For instance, you know, like in a day-to-day -day practice, we see that, you know, instead uh, when we are saying that, you know, we are part of nature, our present life world, we could see that we are becoming a part from nature. So we are glued to the mechanical images. We are not seeing things with the eyes around us. We only hear through the mobile. Rather, I would like to say that we are becoming mobile. So it's very interesting to see the inseparability of the self from the device, an interesting phenomenon to explore. But these virtual ways of living actually, you know, are now much facilitated and enhanced by the COVID protocol, in effect, severs the organic link, an essential requirement of participatory democracy. I feel participatory democracy as a dialogue offers interesting possibilities for negotiated scapes in the emerging terrains of development discourses. The continuous relegation of the common and the day-to-day -day life to the periphery have resulted in various forms of collectives and resistances and has generated the voice of the subaltern. This archaeology of history need to be contexted in the context where unraveling the phenomenology of the absences becomes important when we are try to understand the local narratives and understanding that local narratives thus becomes critical and crucial. So the development in turn in the political governance, in effect, introduce a new set of perspectives, theoretical approaches, analytical techniques to the discourse of the sustainable and the right-based ways of living. And it really speaks of inclusive and democratic structure, which actually, you know, enabled the history to read root through the lens of the subaltern. But uh, here I would like to say that, you know, like instead of the subaltern bodies, usually being said as the bodies are the sites of vulnerability or marginalization, I feel they are very strong sites of resistances also. 
So it is in this context of changing epistemological positions of participatory development that this book, Brick by Brick, is humble contribution from my side to unravel and understand a mammoth decentralized experience in Kerala, people planning campaign, and to see the ways in which PPC address the developmental concerns and issues of the two marginalized sections in Kerala, the women and the tribals, through its interventions of the women component plan and the tribal sub plan. Can we have slides? So the ninth plan of Kerala, it is conceived as a vehicle for deepening democracy, was a unique decentralization experience or the experiment I would like to say, introduced by the left democratic front, a coalition party led by the CPIM. And it attempted to transform the decentralization from an exercise of uh, mere administrative reforms to understand and to mobilize for a political mobilization. So in that way, I could say that it is a real departure or an attempt of a departure of the earlier planning models uh, in its procedures, financial affairs, and institutional setup. So people plan, if you try to see, a 35 to 40% of the state plan fund, that's a huge amount, devolved down to the local body. And I feel it's a bold political initiative towards the process of democratic decentralization. And it's one of the first of its kind in India. And, and the motto, you know, like it's very important because I would like to position the importance of power over here because the people planning campaign, the motto is power to the people. And we know that, you know, in academic discourses, we try to speak about, you know, power through an unconscious subjugation of ideology that we see in an Althusserian framework or a power that we see in a Gramscian understanding or in a Foucauldian governmentality perspective, or the philosophy of praxis of that of uh, Freya. But you know, like here, the power that I would like to position in people planning campaign is one of the, you know, the trans power. Why it is important for me? Because it is um, power that is produced within systems and subsystems of social relations um, in the interactions, in the microstructures that informs the practices of everyday life in politics. So one could also see that in these structures and microstructures, people are not having equal access um, in, in their ability to exercise power. And this inequitable power relations are very problematic. It could be uh, gender relations, it could be caste relations, it could be class relations, it could be ethnic relations, but Inequitable power relations are very problematic. It is here that one could also see the ways in which the dominant group also exercises the power to maintain the status quo. But here in PPC power, when I try to speak in the trans power, especially in the moment of a hegemonic, there is a hegemonic crisis over here, which is basically designed by the dominant class to sabotage any subaltern movement. So the crisis here is what, you know, that old is dying out. We hear, you know, the old forms of the centralized planning system that has been there in the place is dying out. And then there is a new attempt of decentralized planning that is coming into being. But that is that cannot be born. You know, that that the true understanding of the devolution of the power that is not born. So it is this interval, a great variety of mobile systems appear. And trans by being the name, you know, it is temporary, fluid, floating, rootlessness could be easily then appropriated by the vested interest and could make it appear like a permanent structure. So in the case of PPC, what's happening that it had departed from the normative understanding of the centralization and its rigid technocratic and bureau bureaucratic procedures and languages, but it is it to reach the devolution of power faced with decentralization and still groping in the trans space. So it is that, you know, it is, it is here that one could see could be a fertile ground for seizures and appropriation. So can we have the next slide, please? So here then, you know, the whole question about my book, trying to understand uh, the tribal sub plan, women component plan and the media plans of the people planning campaign and try to see, you know, 
what are the variables in the development approaches of the PPC that help the success? I could see a partial success of the women component plan. And what were the reason for the dysfunctions of the development approaches of the tribal sub plan in the tribal context? And then looking at that where media is so important in disseminating the information of this mammoth decentralization experience, what is the role? Why media plan? Because media is always turned to be a fourth pillar of democracy and trying to work with the counter hegemony. Why it could not be a counter hegemonic one? So that is the basic questions that one is posing over here. Can we have the next slide, please? So these are the six phases of PPC, where you could see the first phase of Gram Sabha, where the people comes there and says about their felt needs. And then through the development seminar, they try to make that in the shelf of projects. And then, you know, they try to integrate and make that as the kind of plans at the district panchayat level, and then at the block and the district plan. And then there is a plan appraisal. So here again, there's a very interesting innovation that has been brought by PPC is the voluntary technical corps where, you know, through an advertisement that has been given in the print and the electronic media, the retired hands were asked to be part of this um, decentralization process voluntarily. And they actually, there's a lot of enthusiasm from the retired people to be part of this process for looking at the technical viability, financial feasibility, and then to make that project, you know. So these are the six phases through which the PPC tried to make um, the, the, the plan process. So can we have the next slide, please? So coming to the women component plan, you know, see now, if you're looking at that, you know, then uh, the, the whole question about the women development initiatives and then Kerala has been already always discussed as one of the important ways in which, you know, Kerala development model and where the gendering process or the, the women component plan or the women process, women development has been given for one of the important building block in making the Kerala model of development. Um, so, but in spite of that, I would like to argue that, okay, there's a socioeconomic development, but the status of women in Kerala is not enhanced with respect to the, the given socioeconomic, you know, indicators. So there is, you know, like that, so like when we are saying about, there's a shift from the women integrated development um, to the gender and development, the people planning campaign, uh, was having a cautious and the conscious way of involving and you know to change that you know that women could make a dent a change in the uh, the presence of the public spheres next slide please next slide please so these are the 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 you know the the ways in which the six phases you know there is a in there is an identifying the felt needs of the people that the women were there, and then special chapter in development report on the gender issues, and then special task force for women was there, and a special separate chapter on women development projects was there, and 10 percent to be set apart for the women competent plan, and a separate chapter on women development projects. So this 10 10 percentage of the total plan, you know, that to be laid out specifically for the women competent plan is one of the important interventions that one could see in the case of people planning campaign in Kerala. Can we have the next slide, please? So here, you know, I would like to um, say that, you know, why, you know, Kerala uh, could not strike a direct correlation with this improvement in gender development indicators to the corresponding changes to the status of women, uh, the patriarchal hegemonic power structures interwoven into the everyday lives of the women, and that too in all spaces in Kerala, uh, made women internalize their subordinate position as normative and normal. And I would like to say two examples, uh, uh, which I have, you know, um, encountered in my um, uh, uh, and life there, you know, like the people planning campaign, you know. See, one of the things that um, when we were asking in the icebreaker section, I was asking um, people, you know, uh, the women group and then that was an ice breaking session and asking the women to um, throw the pictures which are familiar to them and most of the women came out with the pictures of men and asked the question reason for that and then one um, woman who was actually 70 said you know I entered the kitchen at uh, 15 there when I started cooking for my uh, father then I started cooking for my husband and then for my son and then for my grandson and then so you know 
I, I don't know the, what is the taste of my tongue and uh, I don't know what is the color of it, you know. So I've never done anything to satisfy my taste buds. So I don't know what is my taste and what is the order of my taste buds, you know. So just, I felt it is very powerful, you know, this word. And another one which I, you know, uh, really, um, and the, the, actually the, um, the title of my next book that is already coming out, you know, it is No One Is Here, you know, Politics of uh, so you know why because i was um, doing the studies in eight states different states in india and then in one of the studies when i was doing um, i was actually being you know like uh, sticking with a norwegian fund and one of the norwegian researchers was also with me and i was translating what the women were saying and i usually go to the afternoon go in the afternoon because that is the time when they are comparatively free. So when I knock the door, then they will come and open the door. And invariably in all the, the eight states that I've studied, one of the first response that I'll get is no one is here. So then I'll tell them, you know, that no, I come here to have an interaction with you because I'm trying to understand. You said, Professor Mahira, nobody is here. It's... No one is here. No one is here. So they will start, they will come, open the door and say, no one is here. You know? So the question, you know, like that whether it is in a Hindi belt, they'll say in Hindi, in Kerala, they'll say in Malayalam, only the language differs, but the idea is same, no one is here. So then, you know, like the Nile tell them, but then Scandinavian researcher asked me, you know, why Manchula, they're all coming and opening the door and saying no one is here. So this actually struck me because I am the person who is actually trying to understand and read the hegemony and how I myself is a, is a part and parcel of this hegemonic process that I could not understand the ways in which we, women internalize their own absences. And that is why they are coming to the threshold of a door and saying no one is here. So how you know that valuable contributions of women are unrecorded, unrecognized, unpaid, and their presence are made invisible and their voices inaudible. So this continuous presences of absences in their life and the historicity of these absences, and then, then making, that, making them internalizing this phenomenology of absences, making them to be absent before their own eyes saying that no one is here. And then we could see that even in the governance structure, we could see you know, their novel initiatives are nipped in the bed, taking, uh, terming it as dysfunctional of the novices. So the market-centric neoliberal policies of globalization that cater to the vested interests of the corporate and the patriarchy, coupled with the hegemony of capital in the socio-political spaces, deteriorated the status of women in Kerala. So, but my question was whether, you know, this app school, people planning campaign is able to make a change from this politics of absence to a politics of presence, to a politics of being or a politics of subjectivity using their agency in the, the positions, you know? So I could, you know, my studies um, with the women, um, we could see that the people planning campaign had a series of trainings at different level that made them to understand the gender position, the status of the women, and also the power interwoven in the socio-cultural political spaces and to make them the positionality to position them as women in the multivariate positions. And the advanced training and the quality of deliberations uh, made them, and one of the important um, important results I feel is the, the, the emergence of the women collectives in the forms of self-help groups. And then also the women status report. They are coming in, out and bringing out the status of the women, which I said is so important to understand that. And then the politics of um, the presence of women, you know, in the public sphere of Kerala uh, was important. And that I felt, you know, one of the important contribution to the people planning campaign to the engendering phases was the formation of the Kudumbasri. Can we have the next slide, please? Uh, as, as, so uh, the politics of women in the public sphere and the formation of the Kudumbasri for me are the two significant contribution of the engineering phase of the people planning campaign in Kerala. So Kudumbasri, you know, it's, it's a um, community-based research, organ community-based organization. And it is one of the largest community-based organization in the world with 4.5 million women. And these women are federated into uh, different tires like neighborhood groups, area development societies, and then community development societies. 
and then you know like SHGs are uh, kind of transferred into that uh, changed um, into um, neighborhood groups. The whole you know the, the right based interventions of the Kudumbasri women, the synergic ways in which they work with the local governance, and then the various um, interventions of the Kudumbasri like the social infrastructure, employment generation, food security in the in the area of health insurance, housing, all are important you know that makes women in the very much visible in the public spa spaces and the public sphere of Kerala, you know. So that I felt is so important. Um, and 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 then then when we, when I'm asking women, you know, they say uh, we got a space in home. So that you know uh, that 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 was very interesting comments. The Kudumbasri women were saying because you know like if you're looking at the Pata Chatterjee's understanding of the, the women women question uh, in the modernity process, and then uh, the 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 ways in which you know the private public questions has been divided and then the women are there in the home but then they're saying that we are getting we are getting visibility in the home you know my husband now introduces me as a chairperson as a member so there is there is a change from an individual who has been defined by the social relations of power to a citizen so this process of women from an individual to a citizen and the gendered citizenship i feel is very important uh, process of the people planning campaign started, you know. Um, then a bank manager, this is a bank manager called me madam. I get an invitation letter in my name rather than, you know, Mrs. So and so. So we may think it's so trivial, but in the everyday life of the women, to get an invitation letter in their own name is so significant for them, you know. And then the whole important second one is the whole question of uh, comradeship, kinship. So in, when we're looking at women, you know, like that the, the, the kinship is actually coming from the family. That is, there are no friends. You know? After the marriage, you belong to the, the family. You know? So, but here that it is, it is bringing back that comradeship, that friendship among the women. Uh, they said in moment of crisis, I can lean on my friend and not, or not alone on my family. And when I die, I'm sure that I will get at least 10 breathe from the public spaces. So it also speaks of, you know, a posthumous public recognition. It is important, like Nancy Fraser's understanding of, you know, politics of recognition, politics of, you know, recognition as counter publics um, in, the, in the public sphere. So that, that, that speaks of, you know, uh, the importance of changing the, the, vis the invisibility of women and making them, you know, at least uh, a passive, you know, at least a partial visible in the public sphere. And now, you know, like, can we have the next slide? Now I would like to look at uh, the tribal sub plan, which was um, not as worked as good as the women competent plan. And uh, in my analysis, I would like to say that, okay, it is, um, it is actually um, not a good one. So in, if you're looking at that, you know, that, 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 that women as citizens that I said, there is a, there's a change from the individual to citizens. And politics of presence of the marginalized and excluded at the local level. There is an enhanced recognition at the personal, family, and, and the societal positions, uh, making monologue into a dialogue and informed citizenry. So it's important because whenever we're discussing about a decentralized planning, an informed citizen is important. So there is a there's a question of informed citizen through massive training and poverty eradication. If you're looking at that to a right-based holistic perspective, and they also elect their own representatives. So they have a vote and voice through the process of election. So can we have the next slide? So here, you know, um, I would like to start with a very, very powerful poem by one of the um, tribal activists. He has written it, Varu Mira. So, so Varu Sonavena. So is a poem from the stage. I would like to read it. We did not go up the stage that was made in our name, nor were we invited onto it. We were shown our place with pointed finger. And we sat there obediently. We were highly appreciated. And they, standing on the stage, kept telling us of our own misery. But our misery remained ours alone. It was never theirs. We mumbled, uttered our doubts. They listened intently and wrote, pulling us by the ear, admonished us, say sorry, otherwise. So, I feel this 84 line, it's such a powerful one that discusses, you know, about 
the issue of appropriation of tribal life and the ways of seeing by the dominant group. It just 84 words. It was more than enough for a tribal poet to explain in depth the decay from within of the experiments, paradigms, theories that we speak, discourses, and then restructuring, and then about the failures of the top-down programs. So Ramchandra Guha, I would like to you know, um, quote from an essay on the occasion of the India's 60th recently Republic Day, he points out to the widespread neglect of the tribals. And he, in that his essay, quote Jaypal Singh Mujah, a spokesperson of the tribal um, interest. And then he, he was making a speech in the Constituent Assembly of India. So I quote, Sir, if there is any group of Indian people that has been shabbily treated, it is my people. They have been disgracefully treated, neglected for the last 6,000 years. The whole history of my people is one of continuous exploitation and disposition by the non-aboriginals of India, punctuated by rebellions and disorder. I take you all at your word that now we are going to start a new chapter, a new chapter of independent India where there is equality of opportunity, where no one would be neglected. I, unquote, six decades, I feel that since this speech was made, the tribal development still remains a mirage with no remarkable difference. So even with innumerable plethora of development policies and programs designed to improve the welfare of the tribals, the approach I usually feel being very paternalistic, ignoring the strength of the indigenous institutions and knowledge of the tribals. And this in turn, I feel contributed to worsening their poverty. So in Kerala also, one could see the exclusion patterns of the tribals operating in different, different spaces. Can we have the next slide, please? So the PPC also tried to have, you know, uh, because uh, knowing that, okay, the PPC is one of the interests is to bring, give uh, the voices to the marginalized to, um, to increase the voices of the marginalized in the decision-making process. They have made very interve cautious interventions here. They made, um, one of the important interventions was a separate Uru Sabha, that is a tribal Gram Sabha was made mandatory so that the tribals could air their problem. And the separate discussion groups, because we know that there is a culture of silence and it is not possible for the people, you know, for the tribals to speak in the, uh, in the usual Grama Sabha, so a separate Grama Sabha was formed, a separate task force was formed, and a special review mechanisms was also formed. And then we also have, you know, the PPC also conducted separate conscientization classes for the elected representatives. Can we have the next slide? But the, 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 the process of exclusion that, you know, that you could see, you know, this is one of the flow chart that I've made uh, in, in Panamara, my area of study in why not the multiple ways of you know if you're looking for the land if you're looking for the communication method if you're looking for the political intervention if you're looking for the development intervention if you're looking for the education interventions so how you know the multiple ways of push and pull effects um, alienated and excluded the tribals in their own habitat can we have the next slide please so uh, the one of the one of the important interventions PPC started training was the um, was the introduction of uh, social activists. You know, the social activists um, was a group of people, uh, tribal actually tribal youth, matriculate or above, uh, selected by the planning board to work in the tribal hamlets and then to report back to the local needs demands of each tribal community so that planning board could redesign the tribal subplan, incorporating more tribal participation. Um, a consolidated monthly salary of rupees 1,000 was given to the social activists. Uh, they were given training. They were given um, uh, facilitation classes to be in the tribal hamlets and then to be at the interlocutor uh, between you know, um, tribal hamlets and the planning board. But what we feel, and then the planning, um, the Kerala, I, Kerala experiments also says that the social activists first defeated the very purpose for which they were set, formed the PPC. You know, once they were injected into the into the people planning process, then they like to identify themselves 
as a part of the bureaucracy. So the, every morning I could see them, you know, getting dressed up and going to the tribal extension office officer. And then they would like to work the sundry jobs, you know, like even doing the sundry jobs of the tribal extension officer, bringing him tea and, you know, doing the um, accounting work there. And they are not interested to spend time in the tribal hamlets. So the whole question about the ways in which they are in they are um, the education system gave them a feeling of getting uh, coming to a higher pedestal the moment they have been affiliated with a tribal extension officer is something that we need to see and critically question about the educational system and then they started um, blaming the tribals their own groups as the causative factors for the failure of PPC. So I could see a very well, you know, a question coming out, uh, the difference of, you know, us and them uh, coming in the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the perspectives of the people. Can you have the next slide, please? So the other thing that we would like to speak about is uh, the media, the role of the media, the information dissemination role of the media, the advocacy role of the media and the vox popular role of the media is so important because uh, decentralized planning, the voices of the people are so important. But on the one hand, we're speaking about the voice of the people are important. At the same time, uh, the media, the conglomerization of the media, the concentration of the media through merge, mergers, acquisitions and the conglomerization, media is getting concentrated. So how can we think about you know, decentralization of the media? So the, the framing and the agenda setting base and then the way in which they hegemonize the consent. Uh, so I feel through my study, you know, that the media plan, so I've done the study of four regional papers and also two national papers, and also an analysis of a content analysis of the media that has been produced, electronic content that has been produced as a part of the people planning campaign. But through the analysis, I found that the media plan was also could not um, uh, place, you know, could not do a counter hegemony structure to that. So, um, so media was also, you know, like that finding it's uh, difficult. So that um, the last, you know, the last part that I would like to say is, can we have the next slide? So one of the three things while I feel uh, problematic in, uh, in, in, in the people planning campaign is the consumeristic ethics and the PPC, because uh, this, you know, like uh, the, the whole idea of about the people to be a part of the people planning campaign to be needed to be political, you know, but how the consumeristic ethics makes people, you know, uh, apolitical, not interested and making consumerism as the way of life and how then depoliticizes and becoming them apolitical and dino syndrome that makes enlarges the situations and making the situation big and mediation of the politics the politics has been always been seen as a huge drama to see and like a serial opera to work it and that also where and devolution and organic intellectuals were never in the picture. Next slide. So I would like to end, you know, when, um, when we're seeing about the power, the power structure and the importance of, you know, the, con the consumerist world, how the things are not coming uh, in the encompassing consumeristic ethics, where we feel shopping, buying, and consuming are uh, the ways of expressing oneself, you know, where the whole question about uh, the, 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 the decentralized governance, the politics of the decentralized governance is not an important there. So embedded in a web of power relations, again, I feel, and consumed by the anxieties about their own marginalities and the legacies of the past neglect. The marginals, I again feel, uh, internalizes the hegemonic values and norms into their cognitive and emotional and psychic systems and structures. And most of them, you know, happens in an unconscious way as the hegemony of the power is strongly internalizes by the marginals. And I would like to end uh, the talk and the book also I ended by quoting a powerful and insightful anecdote uh, shared by a grassroots women worker. I would like to quote that. We are the chosen few to ride the boat of decentralization through the troubled waters of power politics 
to reach the island of power. It is a new boat with a forward facing rowing facility. The moment the great journey was declared inaugurated, we placed our oars in the oarlocks and pushed the water backward to take the boat forward. As the backlash created swashes, those on the land clapped and cheered us. It was a great moment of pride, joy, and confidence for us. After days and months of rowing, we know we had to go a long distance to reach the island of Pa. Some of us pointed out we had not moved an inch. It was unbelievable though, by this time, everyone was convinced what they had said was true. We didn't understand what went wrong. Was it our inexperience in rowing? Didn't we hold the oars correctly? A few of our friends dropped the oars in the water and jumped into the water and began to swim in their earnest attempt to reach the island of Pa. As we continued rowing without any progress, we saw some of our friends drowning and disappearing into the translucent layers of water. A few others were still swimming, braving the waves and oblivious of the undercurrents. Will they make it? Or will they too vanish into the blue? Did the Dead see anything more than we had seen? Will those who are still swimming see anything more than the dead had seen? Who is better positioned? The dead, the struggling warriors, or we who are on the boat? We know the boat wouldn't move an inch. We know its keel is tied to the ground using an invisible chain we could not never break. We are tired. Our sweat may one day flood the river. We are rowing. In the end, it is still the power. Beautiful. Thank you. Beautiful. Yeah. Beautiful. So, uh, thank you so much, uh, Professor Manjula, for, uh, for this very powerful presentation. By the way. And uh, in fact, I uh, this is what I also wanted to say. Long way to go, and because there are many experiments, probably in the final experiment that we have to do. And there's a very famous Hindi song, by the way. And this is what we used to. Uh, sing during our uh, university days, and apparently many of uh, our, uh, our uh, um, uh, I mean, those who are into the people's movement are still singing that. Uh, I, I'll translate it in English later. I don't know how good the translation will be, but let me just uh, 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 do it in, in Hindi first. That hum mehnat ka shwale jag walon se jab apna hissa mangenge, ek desh ne ek hum puri dunya mangenge. So you know when 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 we will demand we'll not just demand the nation but we'll demand the entire world and probably that is how we have to reclaim our spaces, reclaim our spaces in uh, in, uh, in 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 democratic governance in in whatever whatever is ours and I think the the entire world is ours. Thank you so much and I'm glad that you brought in this uh, uh, this Gramscian uh, organic intellectuals also because uh, I don't know somehow we are missing these terms so. Thank you so much. I don't want to say anything more than that. So, uh, uh, Arjun, are you there? I mean, how, how do we go about it? So, uh, is it uh, uh, Dr. Biju or Dr. Malika who would like to take uh, the floor first and maybe start the discussion? So, your preference? <laughs> no, not my preference. Let the preference be of, uh, of the discussions. <laughs> Dr. Malika, you would like to go first? Yeah, no problem, sir. Please, please. Um, thank you for calling me as the Google me as a discussor. And thank you, second uh, sir, for a very wonderful presentation. And as we, I'm living in Kerala and really know that you're working and experiencing this. So, well, uh, hearing it from a, a researcher's point of view, it's really uh, yeah, it's, it's an eye opener. And this book, I feel, it is uh, you know, something just is we can enjoy, just like a novel, and also it's having very serious research topic it included, not like uh, all any other uh, women empowerment so called uh, articles which highlighted this empowered woman in Kerala and this kind of uh, all these propagations with a biased nature. So we are just creating a biased, biased uh, answer. And after that, we are creating some kind of uh, information. Not like that. Manjula's article is basically, it's, it's, a, it's a very serious research, but that's what I had seen. And so I'm going through this book and, and uh, hearing her presentation, I found it's a really wonderful thing. 
because only when uh, critically evaluating the actual conditions in a society, we can try to improve it. And also we have to just find out another solution. So it's, it's, it's provided a historical uh, what is it, group, uh, roots of this, uh, this decentralized planning in India and Kerala. And it can be a good uh, reference book for the uh, PG or research students. Uh, that's what I, I definitely recommend this for my uh, students for a reference material for decentralization and so on. And also it includes a lot of theoretical understanding. It's not a narration of data or something. It's, it's, it provides some kind of very good theoretical uh, understanding to uh, view certain things. And this approach is basically a qualitative nature, but uh, it's substantiate enough quantitative information to, to, to provide a good uh, research work. And uh, what she had narrated, uh, she had given in this kind of woman common plan or the woman participation in people uh, planning. I just uh, had some kind of uh, uh, addition to this because this uh, women kudumbashri and also the self help groups basically targeting the less privileged poverty eradication. This is poverty eradication measure. So that's the majority of the women who are educated and highly need to participate in the power is excluded. So somebody we are just including in this power deliberately, the other side we excluded so many other persons. That's why majority of the women leaders in colleges who are participated and had uh, done a lot of work, but we are not, we never had seen them in this political arena. And those who are inside the households and to their housewives and they need to enter, so get a space uh, that, that kind of people, they got all these powers. So this is the major problem that we, that's what I had seen because in the initial stages, I also participated in this Gram Sabha and then I realized when, when this Manjula had uh, written very clearly that it's only this, uh, what is that, uh, those who want to get some kind of benefits from this, there's the distribution of the benefits. The, there's a, the very uh, philosophy of this Gram Sabha is, uh, uh, so nobody had realized the very uh, philosophy of this Gram Sabha. Uh, there are a place we need to plan something and to implement and discuss the development issues. But the people who are going there, they need to just find out the something, they should, what they should get. So that people will go there and they will dominate the space and the other people who really want to participate will be actually uh, excluded due to this compulsory inclusion. So that's what I had seen. And also another thing is that due to this, and, all, and uh, the last chapter of this textbook, she clearly uh, narrated this uh, COVID and Nipah and this, uh, uh, what's it, uh, this kind of a flood situation, how this people's camp, uh, participation has uh, created a very uh, good uh, uh, implementation of this kind of information and the communication and this and this voluntary work, all these, all these areas, it worked a lot. But at the same time, you see that the other people, the majority of the educated group uh, people, and they are in the middle class, they have uh, enough potential are excluded. So this part should be, uh, this is a very major uh, problem in this uh, Kerala's uh, decentralized planning. That's what I had seen. And, uh, their, their involvement, that means that we are just seeing the number of these participants in Gram Sabha. And another thing is that in the new generation, at the present condition I had seen, the new generation, new women, uh, these groups or some uh, these uh, girls are emerging in this, uh, they are coming. But at the same time, we are not, the invisibility of male members are also another problem uh, here. Because this, uh, whenever we are just trying to include somebody, so we should not exclude others. So there's a planning or the, uh, the democratization of this planning that should include, see, inclusive to all. So that part is very important. Another thing is that the social uh, activist in the case that uh, Manjula Varati has mentioned that I also uh, realized that presently this on a vacation, I just visited five villages, five tribal colonies in Kerala, in Natham, in uh, Vainat. But uh, uh, there also I had this, uh, the problem is that all those who are selected as social activists belongs to the upper class of the Brahmin class of the tribal community, especially Kuruma and Kuruchya community. And these people consider themselves as Brahmins. They will not have any kind of connection with the other tribal communities. So, and also these kind of, whenever we are just implementing, and another thing is that 
uh, in in uh, Meenangadi Panjai, they had done some kind of thing, some kind of uh, what's program. They just uh, with uh, with the um, what is that a close uh, relation with this tribal Katanaika community and they developed a certain persons and work with that without giving any kind of honorarium or anything a voluntary work. These people had booted a lot that had had contributed a lot to this development activities. And if we are just imparting some kind of economic benefit or some kind of power hierarchy to these people, so that actually there is a Sanskritization. No, so that means they are trying to imitate the upper upper class because uh, they are getting some kind of uh, this benefit. And so, so there are a lot of other problems uh, while we are just uh, living with them and the participant observation will provide a lot of good information related to this. Some, because it's not because of lack of education or lack of awareness, but these people are excluded. I had some students who had given me some kind of notes that uh, that's a PG, postgraduate student from tribe, uh, Katanaika community. She's living in a place where the very pathetic house conditions and all. So she's, she's not at all able to communicate with this, uh, uh, this tribal department or anything because the, uh, they're, they're, they, they, though they are educated or they are having this kind of uh, capability, they are not able to approach this uh, tribal department. All the tribal departments are set up in urban areas and all the uh, these tribal communities are in rural remote areas. So all this planning and the days and we are trying to civilize them. So in all the languages itself is, uh, the communication itself is having a big problem. So that's what uh, Manchula is trying to, that's communication and how this uh, uh, people's uh, campaign, that the communication is, uh, is emerged from the grassroots to uh, uh, top, uh, uh, top layer, but that has not happened in the case of tribal community. So, so I found uh, this book is really an eye opener and uh, this, uh, we need to discuss about this book and we have to just add something more. And this uh, uh, book will give some, some kind of a, a path to uh, further discussion about the Kerala's development experience and there's another, um, another way uh, through which we can just discuss the development experience of Kerala. Thank you. <laughs> Sorry. So, uh, thank you, Dr. Malika and uh, uh, Professor Manjula. If, if you're there, uh, what I suggest is let Dr. Biju also uh, actually comment on, uh, on 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 the, on the lecture that you've given, uh, and then maybe you can respond once both. Uh, uh, have uh, commented on that. Is it time, Professor Majula, or do you want to just respond to? Sure, sure. that will be yeah. the best thing. Yeah, sure. Yeah, great. So, thank you. So, Dr. Biju, over to you. Thank you, Dekandra, sir. Uh, and first of all, congratulations, uh, Professor Manjula Bharati. Uh, I'm very happy to be here because uh, I, have, uh, I have been acquainted with uh, uh, Professor Manjula from uh, 2013 onwards. So I got the opportunity to work with her uh, uh, while uh, she was working in uh, uh, Kudumbashri Mission as uh, Chief Operating Officer uh, because I was the uh, District Coordinator of Kudumbashri Mission at that uh, point of time in uh, Kollam District. Uh, so uh, during her tenure uh, as uh, the Chief Operating Officer in uh, Kudumbashri, she expressed her vigor and enthusiasm in utilizing the uh, research capacity she possessed uh, for the well-being of the rural poor and the marginalized uh, in Kerala. I still remember the days when she initiated the micro-level planning process among the tribes in Kerala. As uh, Malika ma'am uh, rightly pointed out that uh, uh, whenever uh, we select some activist or uh, resource persons or uh, something from the tribal population, uh, we used to select it from the upper strata of the uh, tribal community. But uh, uh, at the time of the micro level planning process initiated by Manjula Ma'am, uh, along with the district coordinators in Kerala, uh, we actually selected uh, 
uh, we actually take the pain to select uh, uh, students uh, who, who just uh, have uh, SSLC level or uh, uh, below that, uh, and uh, they are able to read or write. Uh, that kind of uh, students are selected and are trained as volunteers for the micro level planning process among tribes in Kerala. Uh, that was really a wonderful experience. Uh, and I, I also remember the uh, research uh, we did together uh, for the crime mapping in selected uh, local self-government institutions in Kerala. And I appreciate, uh, Madam, uh, your sincere efforts uh, to start a community college for the continuing education of uh, the women members of Kudumbisri Mission in Kerala. So once again, congratulations, Professor Manjula Bharati. And uh, I also take this opportunity to congratulate uh, uh, the IMPRI Center for Habitat and uh, Urban and Regional Studies for organizing a web talk series on uh, local governance uh, uh, because uh, it is uh, a very nice thing because uh, we need to impart this kind of knowledge uh, to all the people, uh, especially on the book written by Manjula Ma'am on people's planning campaign in Kerala in the light of uh, democratizing the local governance in uh, Kerala. So as we all know, the people's planning campaign in Kerala set a model for uh, all of us in India. And uh, we may say that uh, for the world itself for democratizing the local governance. So this book, uh, this book on uh, uh, democratizing the local governance in Kerala uh, by Professor Manjula Bharati uh, really narrated the process in an elaborative manner. Uh, only a researcher uh, with uh, real life experience in sensing the merits and demerits of decentralization through the people's planning campaign uh, would be able to uh, do this. So the whole content is structurally divided into seven chapters, uh, uh, which each chapter deals with various aspects of uh, the people's plan campaign uh, in the different sections of the society as she elaborated among the women, uh, the tribes, uh, and the role of media and all. So in the first chapter itself, it gives a clear picture of the diversification of power from the divine rights theory to the neo-Marxist interpretations, a comprehensive presentation of the decentralization, uh, its uh, emergence over the years, uh, the participatory communication process of the People's Plan campaign, the development strategies of the People's Plan for the upliftment of women population in the society through the microcredit and the SRGs, the role of media, and uh, uh, I could say that uh, it also touches the topic of post decentralization uh, phase of uh, the People's Plan campaign also. Altogether, uh, as uh, Maliga Ma'am uh, uh, pointed out, uh, this is a good reference book for the future researchers uh, in the area of uh, uh, rural development, uh, the uh, women development, as well as uh, the local governance and all. So uh, this gives a vivid uh, account of people's plan campaign in Kerala. Uh, of course, uh, the participatory planning methodology, uh, everything is uh, well uh, narrated by Professor Manjula Bharati. But ma'am, uh, uh, through a critical look, I would like to state uh, uh, some of my observations also, because I think that uh, uh, by including some of them, it would add uh, to your already perfect narration on uh, the uh, decentralization process. I think uh, two major bricks of decentralization of Kerala is, uh, 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 one is a comprehensive legislation such as uh, Kerala Panjayat Raj Act 1994 and the uh, other one is uh, Kerala Municipality Act 1994, along with its features that also, uh, if uh, it uh, that could be added along with this, uh, that will be a good reference material for uh, all the researchers in the uh, decentralization process. Another thing is, uh, as you know, uh, because you are part of uh, preparing this geo and all. So in uh, 1995, uh, in Kerala, uh, we, uh, prepared and announced a government order in 1995 for devolving the functionaries based on the principle of worker along with the work. Uh, that, that is an important uh, uh, government order. Uh, uh, through that government order, uh, we are able to uh, materialize uh, the, the dreams uh, which uh, we put forth uh, through the People's Planning Campaign. Uh, because I think the devolving of functionaries in Kerala paves the way for better functioning of uh, our uh, LSGIs. Even now in uh, states like uh, 
UP and all, somewhat uh, 10 to 12 panjayas have only one secretary. Uh, but in Kerala, the situation is entirely different. Uh, we have a well-structured system of functionaries and over the years, they have adapted it uh, and uh, taken up into their, their own hands and uh, activities of planning and implementation, everything has uh, devolved to the uh, public and uh, uh, the functionaries are uh, leading them in, uh, in an efficient and uh, effective manner. Uh, and uh, the second one is actually the institu institutionalization efforts during the 10th five-year plan. Uh, uh, as you said, uh, in the ninth five-year plan, uh, we have decided to uh, 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 give 25% uh, to 40 percentage of the funds directly to the LSGIs. It's a revolutionary uh, thing, actually. Uh, and uh, the second thing is actually in the 10th five-year plan period, uh, we decided the uh, decided for institutionalization of the efforts uh, that ensure the susten uh, sustenance of uh, the People's Plan campaign in Kerala, uh, uh, which also I think uh, need uh, uh, special attention. Uh, uh, so uh, that is the thing uh, we need uh, more uh, attention and uh, your concentration is on uh, the women and uh, the tribal community, of course. Uh, but uh, we need to address some more the marginalized uh, sections of the community, especially the coastal people, uh, the artisanal uh, people in Kerala, and uh, the levels of participation issues relating to uh, it also need to be addressed. In the future uh, area, as uh, uh, Dikandar Singh sir uh, rightly pointed out in the first phase itself, we need to uh, see what what will be the future what will be the future of all these things uh, there uh, we need to address to, uh, one or two things also because you mentioned about the uh, modus operandi of all these things in the people's plan campaign uh, the gram sabha comes first but in the gram sabha aspect itself there are four different gram sabhas actually there are four different gram sabhas the first one is the planning gram sabha and the second one is the implementation gram sabha and the third one is the uh, monitoring and evaluation Grama Sabha. And the fourth one is, of course, uh, the very important one, the social audit Grama Sabha. Uh, actually, uh, we are now lagging with that particular Grama Sabha because uh, we need to uh, do that uh, in the 25th year of uh, our uh, People's Plan campaign uh, during the celebration. And uh, uh, regarding one thing which has pointed out by uh, Malika, ma'am, uh, you said that uh, uh, the middle class as well as the uh, new generation uh, uh, people are uh, get excluded uh, among the women. Uh, that is why the present government, the present left democratic front government, uh, they have initiated a new thing through Kudumbashri mission. Uh, we are going to start a new uh, thing now that is the satellite units for uh, uh, energies. Hmm? In the structure of energy, that is the SRG in Kerala is known as energy, neighborhood groups. Uh, the structure of energy is only one member, only, only one woman member from a family can become a member of an SRG. But uh, uh, here now the present government uh, for uh, including the middle class as well as the uh, young generation from the families, uh, we are uh, going to start uh, the satellite uh, uh, energies uh, affiliated with the uh, CDS. Uh, that also is a revolu revolutionary move from the present uh, LDF government. Uh, uh, anyway, I, I wish to congratulate and uh, I am very happy to testify that this book is an eye opener uh, indeed. So, uh, uh, and uh, I am very happy to uh, call me uh, to be part of this venture also. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Biju, I mean, it was really interesting I mean, where you uh, mentioned about, uh, uh, I mean, of course, you said you are, you justified, it's important for the book, but at the same time, I mean, some of the critical observations. Uh, now, uh, before Professor Manjula, you respond, actually, I also have two, three queries, and then probably we can go for the way forward. Now, uh, you see, what is important here is, and that, that comes out of my practice, you know, the practice, uh, because I've been in the city governance role, and now I work with the network of cities, that's what we're trying to build. You know, this uh, whole question that Dr. Malika raised and Dr. Biju also raised, and you talk about three Cs, if I remember, in your book, creativity, 
and uh, uh, and and communication and one see from the artistic yeah so i think i mean how creatively uh, though dr biju mentioned something about that uh, are, are you actually witnessing uh, because this paradigm change that has uh, that has happened we can find it pan india i don't know how uh, pernicious it is in kerala because there's a stark difference between urban and rural and and you know because the kind of policies that we are witnessing from um, from 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 the center take for example the smart cities i have written so many times smart city is like writing an obituary of the 74th constitutional amendment you know where alienation the, the entire process of uh, participatory governance is completely scuttled so how does how, i mean or and one of the reasons that i can maybe uh, remotely uh, understand or comprehend for you know the, the 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 rising middle class not participating so do you find a difference between rural kerala and urban kerala this form of uh, participation in the process of planning because inherently the process of planning is quite discriminatory it's it it, it leads to uh, actually it's quite uh, it leads to alienation because they don't want the smart cities the idea is that you know they are techno experts more capital intensive technologies must enter why should you uh, worry about that i mean that's the larger picture the larger gamut that we are talking about at uh, at, at 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 a national and that's why uh, you know most of the plans i mean it's not the city that develops the plan it's the parasitals i mean you have the mumbai development authority you have the delhi development authority i don't know how it works in kerala so so you know when 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 you transgress this idea to the people that look there's someone else who's planning so this alienation further gets consolidated and further alienate. so how do you actually understand in 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 the present context and what is it what is what is the kind of process and how uh, uh, the present government or you know the, the kind of uh, interventions that is being made uh, is trying to arrest it if at all that is that uh then i think uh, uh and yeah and of course uh, 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 this also leads to the ownership because ownership and alienation are uh, are two sides of the uh, of the same coin you know it's the flip side so uh, i mean how, how so you know bringing back people into uh, into this process of ownership uh, reclaiming what what we call uh, you know right to the city because i work more amongst the urban uh, centers so what is it that you, that you are witnessing i think uh, uh, and you know this because this is interesting what dr viju is pointing out i, I didn't hear that this satellite sounds good but at the same time i mean what about the no organic intellectuals you know the kind of so you bring structures and those structures itself turn out to be impediments for for the basic idea that you, that you're trying to build so uh, do you find some kind of uh, 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 some kind of creative uh intervention or creatively understanding this process because it, it's very dynamic i mean it's not static I mean, you know what what was 25 years ago uh it's not the same so that's all prof majul and i think even respond to so also so thank you um to the first question um i will you know first respond because since you are asked the question you know so i can respond to one of the first question is the, the distinction um, between the rural and the urban unlike the other parts of india the kerala model of development one of the defining characteristic is the continuity of the rural urban spectrum and we call it is rural neither rural nor urban you know there's a continuity you know? so even you go to the very distant spaces you could see a public health center there you could see std boots working you could see the roads connectivity roads there you could see the basic amenities working so that is one of the kerala model development one of the the distinctive feature that um, that differentiates differentiates between the rural and urban sites in other parts of because i work in maharashtra and i i live in mumbai so when i go to the outskirts of maharashtra you feel that you are entering into a different premise altogether so that different kind of spaces is not able to see in kerala so we we'll call it as a rural and but still acknowledging the rural rural premise um the people planning campaign and the planning processes and even in the case of kudumbasri one could see that the activities that you see in the panchayats is more vibrant more active than that you see in the ward committees so the the urban spaces is still need to kind of pick up that momentum though it is not as bad as that you see in the other parts of the because right now i'm trying to understand the ward committees in maharashtra and other places 
there it is not as good but the kerala you know it is in a much better place um, so that is the one thing of the urban spaces and the second one that you are asking about the organic intellectuals very interesting question but the organic intellectual is is an answer to the counter hegemony right uh, and the hegemony is in, in, in a such a way that it normalizes uh, the the way you know the ideology to common sense through the socialization practices and how the ideology then becomes a common sense and hegemonizing it but in 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 kerala that if you're looking at you know for example women the patriarchy as a ideology is made into a common sense in the social spaces so hegemonizing that so when a woman getting you know molested or violated when she access the public spaces uh, after 6 7 you know it is actually the women who have been blamed for that because of this panoptic gazes that is there which has been normalized so this normalization process and the patriarchal and the capitalist order even in the left society the embedded society of the kerala you could see it is still patriarchal you could see the number of um, uh, the gender based violence increasing the gender based violence in kerala the number of pedophilia that is increasing in kerala the number of dowry that you know now is becoming an alarming rate in kerala so there is a very patriarchal case that is what i said in the beginning you have you know imr rate infant mortality rate maternal maternal mortality rate the um, sex ratio all you know the indicators the conventional gender indicators are all saying you know good for the kerala model of development but if you looking at the proxy indicators like you know the gender based violence the morbidity rate of the women the suicide rate of the women you know that is increasing and more importantly working participation rate of women you know so i feel that is the most crux so 96 more than 90 percentage is the literacy rate in kerala where it is 50 to 60 in india but when uh, india has a working part female working participation rate of 30 plus kerala has a working participation rate of just 15 plus you know or 16 so where are this working women going sorry where are this educated women going no so that that shows the patriarchal gaze you know you are education is to domesticate the women as a good woman you know marriage because education convent educated women english speaking woman you know a girl is highly saleable commodity in the marriage market so that that you know so then when you're looking at that how the patriarchal ideology is becoming a common sense and then hegemonizing it so to counter hegemonize that you know then that means the people who are working with this people to question the critical consciousness and then to come out have you know social consciousness hegemony consciousness and then come out for a corporate after corporate consciousness to bring the hegemony consciousness open for and that you know that needs a war of position and a war of movement like gram she was saying you know but here in kerala what we see is only a war of you know is that that war of movement that that changing that structure going the confronting there you know? somewhere you can see that the war of position is a trench that kind of you know guerrilla movement the people are looking back and working it you know the counter um, to to have the counter hegemony you should have the people working with the women with the system and to open this uh, the, the the fissures of the that consciousness that embedded into that psyche and say that okay this has been molded by the patriarchal one you know so you need to open that thing and that you know i feel that whether our education system our public sphere system and a politically activated system is able to have that i am very doubtful that is why that you know um, we could not see you know, uh, much of you know when there is when there are issues we could not see the resistance is much coming from there and those resistance is coming is always been branded as feminist you know in in kerala feminist that, that with the quote unquote it's not a good term you know so it is kerala is still a, i feel a very very patriarchal society and We are, we are, we are. We hope because it's. I, I am an optimist, and I hope you know the trans phase, and uh, we will have, like you say, hoping for the real counter um, hegemony to come through the organic intellectuals to put us through the war of movement and position. And then, uh, Biju, your question that you are asking um, is, you know, like that. See, um, it is because the people planning campaign is a mammoth process. 
and it could be analyzed from multiple multiple and varied angles because in you no know, like you're saying about legislation and that analysis it's very important but then um, and and one is that my area of expertise is not on that because i am from a sociology background and would like to look at that you know um, gender and the tribals and that is the area that i'm working and second thing is that okay uh, if you're bringing so many elements it is multi variables you know it is there is the infrastructure that like you're saying about social infrastructure physical infrastructure and then the devolution structures and the bureaucratic patterns that you're suggesting about all are you know itself demands a uh, exploration to make that into a separate book title so it is it is it is it is huge the ways in which because in um, in, in in my phd i said that okay one government order has been revisited 17 times so every time you know so how so to make it participatory so that that i just uh, given a hint you know how participatory every time you know so that itself demands another book to understand the very comprehensive deep uh, embedded base in which you know the bureaucratic things has been deconstructed to align with the requirements of the people planning campaign uh, that is that is and then uh, i am very really interested because first time i am hearing about satellite energies is a new uh, thing to me and i will try to learn more about it is a very interesting concept and then definitely yeah uh, the gram sabha having the four phases and we are still looking for the social auditing phase of the gram sabha right yeah and malika right now you know that you said um, it is it is true you know that the social activists uh, because i i didn't mention even in the book also i think i have not mentioned that part uh, which you you pointed out very clearly you know the social activists are coming actually from the kurichias and the kurichia consider themselves as brahmans and then uh, the other groups like adiyas and paniyas who actually constitute um, more than 60 to 70 percentage of the tribal population the panamaram panchayat that i have studied and how this that they were considered as you know uh, outcast by the kurichia community and even kurichia community even consider when i go there they also consider you know them as brahmanic brahmins at the base of living is that they consider them as you know position that and most of the social activists because of their epistemological understanding and the ontological positioning of of putting them as brahmins you know uh, and then seeing these people as untouchable um, or you know people uh, who 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 don't understand anything uh, need to be also look yeah that is a good point uh, thank you thank you prashant man that right? was a lovely discussion and we've already crossed uh, uh, one and a half hour we thought we'd wind up in one hour but i think we are uh, uh, probably this also speaks about uh, the the importance of uh, of the book and of course uh, uh, local governance and uh, uh, arjun i i suggest you just uh, uh, arjun are you there i am here sir yeah so you see so if you want to make some remark or else we will we'll just wind it up so we have we have manish ji yeah manish Achha, and i forgot to tell uh, uh, mention because there were a few queries here and the queries uh, said can there be a question answer i think we can take if uh, there are some q and a's but i don't find here yes maybe on the facebook then we can take take those questions yeah right manish manish yes, ji i have heard the whole discussion ma'am it was very intriguing and like i loved the discussion like one point you mentioned was like status of women not enhanced in kerala like i think uh, the status of women is not enhanced in any part of the country for now uh, and like after like uh, after i look into uh, the things like hatras we can say or like unnav uh, like we can say uh, there is a thing in like local governance of ruler base there is still a uh, prevalence of caste system you can say so like how we can like uh, like it's a matter of concern for us so like how we can uh, like take out that caste system out of uh, like ruler india even like dr b r ambedkar have said like uh, the ruler india is a hub of manu smriti we can say like people still follow the um old age system even we have 
खाप पंचायत विच आर स्टिल द थिंग्स ऑफ थिंग्स बेस्ड ऑन पैट्री आकी सिस्टम सो लाइक हाउ एज अक हाउ एज अ पब्लिक पॉलिसी और एन अर्बन पॉलिसी मैनेजमेंट हाउ वी कैन लाइक टेक दैट सिस्टम आउट लाइक हाउ वी कैन सेव द रूरल रूरल इंडिया लाइक आई हैव वन सिस्टम आई हैव लाइक I thought of giving separate electrodes for a scheduled caste and scheduled types in local panchayat system, uh, like which would help them to raise their voice against the system. So, like, any thoughts about that? Yeah, sure, sure, Manish. You know, like that um, caste is a strong marker of uh, exploitation and marker of exclusion in all parts of, not even in the uh, rural India, but even in the urban India also, because. that may you know the ways in which the uh, the caste manifest in the public spaces sometimes it may be very visible and up in front of you and sometimes it comes as a very strategic forms of you know like in kerala you can say that because i have worked in bihar rajasthan and then the ways in which the caste comes in front of you as uh, quite naked as it is and in the in kerala when is booking it is coming as a quite strategic ways of discrimination not up front you know so the caste is there and then the ways in which you know then the caste we, we are saying that when we are having the 73rd and the 74th amendment we are saying that okay caste uh, the representation should be there so to deepen the democracy not only to widen the democracy to have the people of uh, to promote the idea of uh, inclusive of, um, democracy but the, uh, like amartya sen was saying very interesting observation you know when we have a very interesting idea and or an ideology and then look at the institutions and then we have the practices so once you try to understand you know then you have certain ideology of a inclusive democracy participative democracy and in institutions of uh, local self governance institutions uh, to implement this ideology and you have practices but when you try to correlate between the the idea and the practices you see that there is a lot of gap coming up and why this gap is coming up because of the social inequalities and the inequities that is embedded in the system that makes this the sister envisioning ideologue and the manifested practices to be in a divergent spaces we are speaking of inclusive democracy and then we have the reservation practices through the local governance systems to bring the people in the marginal periphery to the decision making process but in reality even in the decision making process we are in institutionalizing the social patterns of social inequality and inequities and make the people you know feel uh, see for the women uh, coming from the uh, the lower caste you know there's a public patriarchy along with the caste dimensions you know so in karnataka when i uh, went there to do the study the um, when the people are there the uh, the, the, the 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 reservation posts are actually been auctioned publicly auctioned in temple premises so the upper caste persons are buying the tickets so then so you know that has been open auctions you know in temple and that has been uh, reported in the newspapers and i went there and saw it by myself so what happened it's been auctioned and then a uh, uh, lower caste for example a lower caste woman who has been working in the in, in a in a in a upper class upper caste person and then they have bought the ticket they are buying the tickets of the lower caste and then it is all or the whole question of you know they they, they don't know even know that they are standing in the election it has been bought so uh, there are that is what i said the trans power the whole question of appropriation of the base in which the institutional structures are there and then the dominant groups are still using the same institution the same ideological structure to appropriate that so the uh, local governance institutions itself been appropriated by the existing inequalities and inequities that is present in the system so now we have to see that okay what are now happening now is the whether there is a consolidation so if you are saying in the in the case of uh, caste i could see that there is a very strong dalit coming up you know the dalit voices which is a political voice very strong political voice that is coming up so politicization of the dalit voices and then coming up and consolidating these voices and then questioning the inequities within that spaces and then going for a uh, counter hegemony through the mobilization of this forces will be a real answer and then actually we could see some of these things 
and at, at, at micro narratives in, in because in my study uh, in Rajasthan, I could see, you know, that at least six women uh, punches who are actually from the lower caste questioning the upper caste women, you know, upper caste people, and then saying it. One, I would like to say one example, and I would like to end it. See, in one of the panjayats, you know, that did this happen in Maharashtra, one of the panjayat deliberations, um, one upper caste man used to, you know, when a lower caste woman was asking questions, you know, he used to say, okay, you people, you women never understand, use some abusive words against this, and then, you know, and then this woman called him by the hand, no, and then slapped him the grams up. No, so I'm not saying that slapping is an answer, but then persisting then and there itself, and uh, and then locking the office, the office of the block development officer with the collective groups, saying that okay, they are not working in the interest of the lower caste women. So there are multiple local, very local narratives that is emerging, which is actually a, a, a manifested voices of these local narratives coming through the mobilization. Of the Dalit voices, so it is happening here. Really, so I'm optimistic. Yeah, ma'am. Okay. okay, so I think that before we wind up, uh, uh, I think there's a question also, uh, Arjun, ma'am. What is the background of the implementation of Padum Shri? Why did uh, this grassroots level social mobilization come to picture in the first place? Yes, and <laughs> let me also add to that. Yes, one question we can also take to a way forward that Southern India is really, you know, progressing much, but why does the North India and ma'am, what do you see for uh, Uttar Pradesh or Bihar or Jharkhand, these places, they are adopting in the government terms, there is a lo lot of knowledge transfer and everything. And since you are also COO, you can suggest what, what the other, other places can learn from these practices and how to scale up, if you can also take that. Professor Manjur, have, have you got that question, the Kudumshiri thing? Yeah. Kudumshiri, I didn't get it. What is the question? Okay. What is the background? Yeah. What is the What is the background of implementation of Kudumshiri? Why did grassroots level social mobilization come to picture in the first place? The Kudumshiri is actually a state poverty eradication mission. So it is a spam, you know. So it is actually the importance of Kudumbasri, I feel, is the unique positionality of state in the, you know, state is bringing in the neoliberal governance where the state is never a part of the discourses, especially the public discourses. Now, the positionality of the state is brought back into the discourses where, you know, like it is 100% it is funded by the state, then the activities. So the state is, is the role of the state is back into the, the, the discourses and saying that, okay, the whole question of, you know, empowerment. When we're saying about empowerment, you know, uh, there is a lot of difference between empowerment and powerful. Empowerment means it does not have a history of, uh, of you know, it is a history of powerlessness. So that means some people who are powerless, now a cautious and a conscious intervention to make them powerful. But when you're looking at powerful, they may not be having a history of disempowerment. So there is a difference between this powerful and empowered. So uh, this PEM is a conscious effort from the state of Kerala, bringing in the positionality of the state into the uh, discourses and to empower the people because they have been disempowered. So how can that is, that is the, the whole question you know, that we are saying. And how then the women then started asking about the rights of their own spaces and position. So it's a rights-based discourse of development. Where, you know, like right-based discourses, you know, like that the, the poverty, when you're training, it's not an income-based poverty. Any denial of human rights is a poverty. So when you're looking at the Kudumba Sri, the, because they consider poverty as a denial of any forms of right. So when I don't have the right to be mobile, women are not having the right to mobile, then I am I am I am I am, I am facing poverty. When I cannot choose my life partner, I am facing poverty. So what is the power to choose to the right to choose from the plethora of choices around you, and whether I have the right to choose? And then any denial of that choices for me, you know. So the women looking at their own positions in from their ontological and epistemological understanding and try to look at their own status in their own neighborhood coming together 
seeing the right based understanding of the ways of living. So that is the grass based, you know, uh, so that we call it as gender self learning process, GSLP, gender self learning process. That the question has been asked by the women and they're trying to give answers to it because it's coming from them and they're trying to address it. So it's a very interestingly political question, epistemological question. So it, 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 it breaks the, the ruptures, you know, of epistemology of expert led given because the women are themselves asking the questions and giving the solutions to it. So it's an epistemological break. So that is the Kudumbasri thing. And the other one that you're asking about the North South divide, this is a huge question. Um, I cannot, you know, uh, answer within this time period. But uh, if you're looking at Kerala, specifically, you know, because the historicity of Kerala and the civic actions. Uh, that happen in Kerala. So we have a literacy movement, you know, we have, a, we have a very strong library movement. So the civil society was very active and it is active civil society um, in, the, in the renaissance period of Kerala gave a specific impetus uh, to the, the growth of Kerala to move it forward. But I could see, you know, that the same, uh, the thing that happened uh, in, in the new spaces, of Kerala, I could see a withdrawal of even that, you know. So I'm a little skeptical about it. Um, but yeah. Okay. okay. Thank you, Thank you. Mr. Manjula. And uh, Arjun, you want to add a word or shall we wind it up now? So one, one minute way forward to each of our panelists. Did you say okay. that I'm also fine? So let's start with uh, uh, Dr. Viju, and then probably last would be. Professor Manjula, and then maybe I'll make a comment. Dr. Biju? Yes, sir. Yes, yes. Uh, actually, the mission Kudumbasri uh, leads to a position where uh, the representation of uh, women in the local self governments. Actually, we made a reservation of 50%, compulsory. It's mandatory. But it is now more than 50%. It is uh, somewhat 55% now. Because the women are now in a position to compete with men and uh, they are defeating the men and uh, they are uh, uh, getting opportunities there. And uh, when Madam was working in uh, Kudumbasri, uh, she always uh, uh, telling the fact that even in uh, the uh, left uh, political organizations, uh, the women are not get elected as uh, the, uh, the key positions of the party. But now that also is getting changed because yesterday uh, in the... Uh, area committee meeting of uh, uh, CPIM in Wayanad, uh, one lady get elected uh, by defeating all other uh, male uh, participants. She elected as the area secretary of CPIM. So uh, in that way, we are uh, trying to uh, uh, empower. But uh, the patriarchism is there. <laughs> the women are also uh, going in tune with that. Anyway, this uh, discussion is very fruitful and uh, it gives me more insights because I am from actually from the commerce background and uh, I'm trying to study the women as well as the tribes uh, uh, with regard to their uh, financial background, family financial management, the financial planning aspects and all. <laughs> and now this is uh, really a wonderful experience. Thank you. Thank you. Do we have a, a, Dr. Malika there? Dr. Malika, are you still there? Way forward, I mean, if, you know, in a minute, if you want to say, I mean, what? what, what I know, but, uh, had uh, given uh, the explanation of uh, what the comments we had given. But the only thing that while well, she's mentioning about this uh, uh, labor market participation, and uh, I have noticed that in India, uh, the participation rate is high because of unpaid family worker category is very high in outside India. But in Kerala, that category is lesser. That means the economic participation, actually economic participation is high. The quality of work participation is high in Kerala. So, and uh, another thing is that Kerala is in the third state and we need more infrastructure when compared to all India level. We need that kind of a development policies. When the, in, when the inclusion of these women and their needs, the planning process, and those who need to go outside and uh, enter into this labor market need to get some kind of basic infrastructure facilities. That part is not discussed in Kerala. That is the major reason which I had seen because 
almost all in this um, uh, in labor market the women those who want to go out and search for job opportunities and all so they need to get some kind of that infrastructure so that infrastructure is missing because these people are not having any kind of voice in the planning procedures that is the major reason because if they want to go out their household is a production unit if they want to go out somebody should be should, uh, uh, that's a, that's a, that's a, they somebody should be there take that part on uh, that area so this should be coming if there is a demand so this is the demand and supply so this part is not discussed in kerala because we are in a broader sense and in the context we are discussing about gender issues and in the, that particular place we can see that kerala's uh, this uh, gender uh, the strategy we need another policy is by understanding actual problems in kerala because it's not exactly like the other parts of india uh, we, we we should see it in a different uh, different angle as well i would just uh, like to, to see <clears throat> and uh, there in the uh, biju uh, this uh, dr biju has mentioned that the supply this uh, uh, this uh, this units or some kind of nsd that kind of uh, things are going to implement so it's an organic development is there in mini kerala a lot of people they want to enter but these people are deliberately excluded and th that is that's one of my, me i just i'm what i'm saying a person who is actively the male member who is actively participant in a political party or in social arena their women or the wife or sister or mother is getting participation but the other people are excluded those who are as a divorced or this uh, the fighting all these people's voice should be come it's not be it's not coming from top to bottom it's the bottom level is coming but these people are not representation and that's the major problem there we need to uh, in, uh, uh, create some kind of another strategy to understand the basic issues of kerala it's not like the whole other uh, uh, the other areas uh, the, the, this kerala should be studied in a different manner because we need the the infrastructure which we needed uh, in that the third stage of development we entered in the third stage almost all the other part we are just entering in the second stage or the first stage to a second stage but we uh, entered in the third stage and still we are discussing about this first stage developmental issue so that is the major problem which i had uh, identified so thank you thank you jean by uh, for invite me to be a part of this thank you Okay, so I think Professor Bharti, would you like to say the last last few words, maybe in a minute? Thank you so much for uh, this talk and that wonderful discussions on that. And I would like to end, you know, that it is important to understand uh, the governmentality of this decentralized governance, and then the ways in which the mentality in which the people are governed and then govern. and how we are all of us are subjects or objects to this process and we are govern and governing so how it is important to understand this power that makes us in the subject positions all of us you know so and from with that critical eye to look at the decentralized cover thank you so much everyone and especially thank you, thank you professor manjula simi i i you want to say something simi No sir. No. Sure. Yeah, yeah. It was. Uh, I just wanted to. I can say allow you to say something. Last words, yeah. Huh? Okay. So thank you so much. Thank you, Professor Manjula, uh, Dr. You. Biju, Dr. Malika, the entire team from Mumbai, Arjun, of course, and Simi, and of course, Chavi is. I don't know whether she's. I think it's too late. Probably she has to rush back to her home, and probably we all know what we have to do now. Uh, uh so i don't think that i need to add anything else except that uh, this dialectics of uh, you know what professor manjula said uh, governmentality and the kind of changes so this is i think it's 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 it's, it's a long way to go because there will be many structures coming in some will falter and maybe more structures will be created or and finally when we lead to a structureless uh, uh, space uh, spaces i don't know when that that's going to happen Well, not in a lifetime, but there's something very pertinent that uh, I need to mention here. And uh, moving from gender, because gender, I think uh, Professor Manjula and uh, all uh, both the discussants were able to cover well. Actually, this there is this 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 strong uh, uh, kind of alliance between what you call market forces 
the, the kind of neoliberal capitalism that we are witnessing and feudal values that exist. And it's pernicious, let me tell you. When it, 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 because, you know, I have been planning cities. I know how the cities are planned. I mean, I was the, 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 the directly elected mayor. And I thought, I will plan the city. No, it's not the elected. There's some other set of structures that plan the city and how empty gender, how biased these structures are. I do not have time, but I could have explained that. And, you know, the kind of interests that they cater to. But at the same time, I think we should not miss the point what Professor Manjo was saying, you know, and since she comes from a sociological background, is, you know, the kind of society that we live in. Now, take, for example, I, I have moved to Delhi from Simla. I don't know why I did that. But actually, I'm inhaling a complete toxic air. Now, now I was just just thinking about it, you know, how feudal value, the, the entire system of hierarchy, you know, the entire mobility plan, I mean, almost 70% of this toxic air comes from our own mobility, uh, the, the kind of mobility that we have been uh, uh, developing in, in, in urban centers. And the entire hierarchy, because the push has been A, from more capital intensive kind of uh, um, uh, uh, mobility driven, but at the same time, you know, that is the kind of values that we have imbibed and we passed on the hierarchy. I mean, just imagine the prime minister going to the office on a bicycle, the chief minister going to the office on a bicycle. Why can't, why can't, why, can't, why couldn't have we done that? But, you know, because of this hierarchical values that exist in the society, actually we are in, 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 in a real mess. And the mess is not just sociological, <laughs> it's actually in front of us in every sphere, I, I would tell you. So, you know, mayor, lights, more cars, larger, larger, the larger the bandwagon. I think, I think that's something that's something very, very uh, pertinent. In fact, uh, when we talk about, we have to get rid of it. And, and fa in fact, this brings in uh, to the last point that I wanted to say is that, you know, the whole question of governance structures based on the question of citizenry, not even citizenry, residents you know, treating residents as equal has actually, now I don't know whether we're in a transition form or are, are we witnessing a metamorphosis from a ruler ruled kind of uh, 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 relationship, which is more dangerous. And, uh, you know, there's somebody who's going to come, there's somebody who's going to plan, there's somebody who's actually doing it, doling out money to us, and that's how we run our governance structures, is the kind of consciousness that is getting continuously imbibed and actually that that that, that, that is how, how things are ha happening i think the, so 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 this this relationship or this dialectics between uh, the kind of uh, values that we live in and the kind of uh, what you said neoliberal capitalism uh, driven towards commoditization of everything is i think uh, something very important that we will be will be watching and waiting because in one of our shows we learned you know, in, when we plan the city, we will not plan a, uh, a ground, but we'll plan a stadium. So we'll not plan a health center, we'll plan a super speciality hospital. And the kind of pathologies that we build now, we're realizing, hey, we have to revisit the entire planning process. So thank you so much for these words. I think I would once again thank Professor Manjula. It's been uh, a lovely, fascinating uh, uh, presentation. And also we, uh, we came to know, I mean, how uh, Kerala is quite different, but the challenge is also that the, that Kerala is facing, and I think that's 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 what what is bound to happen as well. But definitely, it's a, it's a kind of lighthouse, it's a ray of hope for uh, for structures of uh, urban governance. You know, where planning process can be decentralized. It was only thought of; it has actually been implemented, maybe to not to to the extent that it should have been. So thank you so much, and thank you, Empri, for uh, taking time. It's almost two hours now. And I think we should go back, and some of us have to cook food while we go back to our homes. Kerala, I can still understand because Kerala, your your evening starts late, but here in Delhi, we sleep quite early. Yeah? Or not in Delhi, but similar, of course, we sleep by nine or nine. Thank you so much. So, Arjun, you want to add something? Or Simi? Yeah. Maybe. Simi, what are things? Thank you. Thank you, uh, Tikender, sir, for your uh, brilliant uh, concluding remarks to this brilliant deliberation. Um, I mean, I couldn't have uh, really uh, thought of um, 
adding anything else because I just wanted to uh, propose the formal vote of thanks. But definitely it has been uh, very, very enriching and a learning experience for all of us to understand uh, the, demo, uh, the, the decentralization experience in Kerala. Um, the, the book that is written by uh, Professor Manjula Bharti, congratulations, ma'am, to you for the book and the, the book that has been released by uh, Honorable Chief Minister of Kerala himself. So congratulations uh, for this feat. And we also congratulate you uh, for your upcoming next book. Um, so with this, I would like to propose the formal vote of thanks on behalf of the IMPRI Center for Habitat, Urban and Regional Studies. Uh, this um, you know, local hashtag local, local governance uh, series that is being led by Tikender Sir. Um, thank you to our moderator, uh, Tikender Sir, for uh, this brilliant discussion that has just taken place, and to our discussants, um, Malika Ma'am, and also to uh, Biju Sir. Thank you for your presence and for your for your contribution to this um, entire discussion it really enriched it further and also to um, our um, other uh, other participants who question who provided their valuable inputs and questions and to all the attendees here on uh, zoom and on facebook live and to all those thank you so much that uh, you will be watching us later on uh, youtube and listening to us on uh, on the podcasts so thank you and i wish you all a very good evening Thank you. Thank you.